Alors, je... Donc, bonsoir, euh, bonsoir à tous. Merci d'être euh, présent pour cette, euh, non pas première conférence du cycle euh, hybride, parce qu'en réalité, en fait, il euh, y a eu un, un certain nombre de, de conférences de ce type qui, euh, qui a été euh, menée et organisée par le LABEX euh, Art H2H, notamment au Conservatoire national supérieur des arts dramatiques. On a le plaisir d'accueillir à nouveau euh, ce cycle ici à l'école normale, euh, euh, l'école normale, l'école su supérieure des arts décoratifs, c'est un, un lapsus. On a beaucoup de liens avec l'école normale juste à côté, donc euh, parfois les frontières sont floues, ce qui peut être aussi une, une, bonne, une, une bonne chose. Simplement, juste avant de passer la, le, la parole à Emmanuel, Emmanuel et Queens, qui va présenter plus précisément la conférence de ce soir, je tenais simplement euh, d'une part à vous accueillir euh, à, à vous dire encore une fois merci, mais surtout vous préciser euh, le, le contexte en fait de ces, euh, de ces conférences et le contexte des écoles d'art au sein euh, de ce qu'on appelle les LABEX, les laboratoires d'excellence, et notamment ce LABEX qui s'appelle Art H2H, qui a euh, pris naissance notamment à l'université Paris 8 avec de nombreux partenaires dont fait partie l'ENSAD. Et c'est un élément important parce qu'en fait depuis plusieurs années, et notamment à l'ENSAD depuis 2007, euh, où nous avons mis en place un laboratoire qui s'appelle ENSAD Lab, il y a un certain nombre de, de travaux, de programmes de recherche, euh, recherche dans le domaine de l'art et du design qui ont été mis en place et qui se fait de manière à la fois spécifique dans le domaine euh, artistique et notamment dans une école d'art et de design et on sait que cette école d'art et de design est très, très spécifique notamment parce qu'elle a des enseignements et des recherches euh, dans le domaine artistique et de, et de design mais aussi dans un environnement académique universitaire et ça, ça nous semble très important euh, d'être à la fois dans les réseaux universitaires, non pas pour se conformer à des modèles universitaires qui sont extérieurs en fait aux écoles d'art, mais pour inventer ensemble des modèles de pratiques euh, de recherche en art et en design, et c'est notamment le, le cas d'Ensad Lab. Et je dois dire que euh, cette invitation ce soir est particulièrement euh, intéressante euh, pour, pour, pour l'Ensad Lab, puisque Simon en particulier a été invité euh, par Emmanuel et Queens, pour intervenir aussi dans le cadre d'un workshop, euh, dans le cadre d'un des programmes de recherche euh, d'Ensad Lab qui est piloté par Samuel Bianchini, qui est ici euh, présent, et qui est en fait un des programmes de recherche, il y en a sept au sein d'Ensad Lab, qui questionne beaucoup les relations entre les technologies euh, et les pratiques artistiques, parfois à la frontière même du, euh, du design, et je crois que les aspects notamment de, de la robotique sont assez présents dans, dans, dans le cadre de ce, de ce programme de recherche. Donc voilà, je voulais simplement en tous les cas vous dire qu'il y avait un certain nombre de, de conférences hybrides qui allaient se tenir donc euh, ici. Vous avez juste à l'entrée le programme des prochaines conférences hybrides qui se tiendront donc euh, à l'ENSAD. C'est quelque chose qui est important pour nous parce qu'en fait le, le LABEX, euh, appartenir à l'ABEX, ce n'est pas simplement une convention, ce n'est pas simplement une appartenance administrative euh, à un, un appareillage ou un dispositif universitaire, c'est vraiment une participation, une collaboration forte un projet commun et notamment avec un ensemble euh, de décisions communes sur les perspectives de recherche qu'on doit mener encore une fois ensemble, mais aussi l'opportunité euh, que nous offre le LABEX rh 2 h de collaborer avec un certain nombre de laboratoires euh, universitaires, mais aussi, et c'est un élément important aujourd'hui, de financer les activités euh, de la recherche, parce que le, le financement de l'activité de la recherche doit se faire à l'intérieur des écoles, et comme vous le savez, ce type d'école dépend euh, du ministère de, de la Culture, et au ministère de la Culture, on n'a pas une ligne budgétaire importante pour ce qui concerne la recherche. Il est donc important d'avoir des, des sources de financement qui proviennent des LABEX. Et ces sources de financement ne viennent pas non plus uniquement des LABEX, ce sont des leviers pour euh, dégager, euh, faire émerger de nouvelles perspectives de recherche, donc des objets et des sujets de recherche, mais aussi ça permet de légitimer un certain nombre de, de nos actions et d'avoir de, des financements euh, autres dans d'autres euh, formes de, de partenariats euh, extérieurs au, au LABEX. Je vais laisser le, la parole à Emmanuel Queens, euh, qui est un historien d'art euh, bien, bien connu, qui est maître de conférence à l'université Paris 8 et qui est également chercheur euh, intervenant de manière euh, forte au sein euh, d'Ensad Lab. Donc je vais te laisser le soin, euh, Emmanuel, de, de présenter la conférence de, de ce soir. Merci à vous en tous les cas d'être euh, aussi nombreux. Merci beaucoup Emmanuel. Oui, effectivement, donc, euh, on est très heureux d'accueillir aujourd'hui Simon Penny. Euh, cette intervention s'est faite dans les cadres des conférences hybrides, comme Emmanuel l'a rappelé, donc, euh, 
dans le programme LABEX, donc AH2H, et en fait en particulier dans le dispositif qui est le, le, le programme de chair internationale. Donc Simon, donc, euh, ensuite à notre demande, sera avec nous ici à Paris un mois, et donc on aura vraiment la possibilité, dans le cadre de notre programme de recherche, euh, de euh, travailler avec lui. Donc quelques mots sur notre programme de recherche, donc il s'appelle euh, The Behavior of Things, donc, euh, et euh, qui est un programme autour de la notion d'objet à comportement. Donc c'est un programme qui est donc financé par, par le Labex et qui réunit plusieurs partenaires, donc euh, l'Insad Lab, comme Emmanuel l'a dit, notamment avec l'équipe euh, Reflective Interaction dirigée par Samuel Bianchini, l'équipe euh, de Paris 8, donc, euh, avec moi, et aussi une équipe des sciences cognitives donc, dirigée par Elisabeth Azzibetti, donc euh, les laboratoires Chartes euh, Lutin, et aussi les centres Pompidou. Donc le projet a débuté en 2012 et euh, c'est un projet qui s'articule à plusieurs volets, un volet plutôt de recherche euh, historique sur le, les apparitions donc, de ce, ce que nous avons appelé les objets à comportement qui sont finalement des objets euh, dotés d'animés et doté des mouvements euh, robotisés dans la majorité des cas, sur lesquels on projette euh, une attitude, un comportement. Donc euh, nous avons réalisé une première partie, donc un recensement euh, d'œuvres et de recherches historiques, euh, qui, a, euh, qui nous a permis par exemple de réaliser l'année dernière un premier colloque international auquel euh, donc Simon Penny est intervenu, mais aussi Anne-Marie Duguet qui, qui est ici aussi. Donc, et, euh, et là nous sommes en train donc, de commencer une deuxième phase dans notre projet qui est plutôt donc une phase de euh, recherche pratique euh, avec notamment des workshops et donc nous sommes très heureux de commencer cette semaine un workshop avec, avec Simon. Donc quelques mots sur, sur notre intervenant. Simon Penny donc il est professeur à l'université de Californie à Irvine et il a un parcours extrêmement complexe dont il nous parlera aujourd'hui parce qu'il est passé de plein de disciplines différentes. Il est en même temps euh, théoricien artiste, historien, euh, avec, euh, il y a aussi un autre point qui, qui, qui nous lie, c'est qu'il est aussi un spécialiste de la philosophie de la cybernétique, qui est un moment très important pour notre, pour notre projet, et, euh, donc, euh, et aussi il a travaillé sur des projets, vous, vous verrez aujourd'hui, qui sont à la, à la, au croisement entre euh, la recherche artistique et la robotique. Donc euh, merci Simon d'être là. Et euh, je vais lui laisser la parole. La, la conférence va avoir lieu en anglais. Euh, et euh, ensuite, il y aura, si vous voulez, euh, un moment d'échange avec la salle. Et il faudra bien parler dans le micro parce que la séance est enregistrée. Donc, merci beaucoup. So, uh, good evening. And uh, first, I, I apologize for not being able to speak to you in French, and I, uh, I'm grateful that you will uh, listen to my presentation in English. I will attempt to speak slowly and clearly. So, um, I will show several uh, documentation of several works uh, during the presentation, interspersed between uh, uh, speaking. So the period between 1985 and 2005 was a period of radical change in computer technology and a period of radical change in social and cultural practices uh, around these changing technologies as computing moved beyond uh, military, business and academic contexts into uh, domestic and professional contexts. What I want to discuss today is, is the uh, context of those watershed <coughs> first decades of digital art practice in terms that contest the popular notion of convergence. Indeed, I argue that uh, the emergence of digital arts practices as we know them today was not a convergence but more of a conflagration in which wildly divergent worldviews collided. Digital arts practice rose from that wreckage like a phoenix from the ashes. At least that's what it felt like at the time. I can attest to that as I was intimately engaged making work, developing technologies and formulating critical and theoretical positions. 
I want to emphasize the way that these things occurred together organically in my process. My theoretical inquiries emerged from and were generated by the challenges I encountered in attempting to realize new kinds of artworks. In this, I do not propose that my perspective is authoritative or my experience was especially notable. I think any aware artist, researcher at the time had similar experiences. Now, the first question one should ask when engaging in digital arts practices is why? Uh, specifically, why is it important to work in this context? What can or should be said about the context and what new things can be done in the context? Now, the answer to these questions is quite different now than it was 20 years ago. So, the, paper, the presentation will be in six parts interspersed with video. So, there were um, three themes which have emerged in my practice, as I can identify them now. The first one was uh, the underlying conflict between the computational worldview and conceptions of art practice. This, in my opinion, is the fundamental theoretical crisis around conceptions of the nature of being and cognition. The position reified in computer culture affirms a separation of information and matter analogous to the Cartesian separation of the res cogitans and the res extensa. To put it simply, the mind-body dualism is reified in the hardware-software dualism. In the arts, there is and always has been a holistic, embodied and situated idea of intelligent action in the world, rooted in the materially engaged artisanal pra and artisanality of practice. But, regrettably, this commitment is seldom made clear in theory. The second key idea in my work has been the development of a theory of interactivity as part of an aesthetics of behaviour, informed by theories of emergent complex behaviour and other ideas from artificial life. In my opinion, the fundamental novelty of computing in the arts is the capacity for designing dynamic, responsive, ongoing behaviour. The idea of the behaving artefact is new in the world and new to the arts. It therefore calls for a new aesthetic theory. The third structuring idea uh, is, is, it has to do with theories of embodied cognition and their relevance to the arts. Now this interest arises from the first and second because in a fascinating historical coincidence, the cognitivist worldview was collapsing at precisely the same time that computing was moving out into culture beyond the academic, military and business environments where it had been deployed as a calculatory technology. So, artificial life and embodied cognition emerged as a way out of the crisis of cognitivism. And now, Olivier, could you please play the first video of Petit Mal? So this is documentation of autonomous robotic artwork, uh, which I started to build in 1989. It was completed first shown in 95. Uh, that date is slightly wrong. <laughs>
Could you reduce the volume, please, Olivia? Good, thank you. So Petit Mal was made from the ground up, mostly out of out of junk and second-hand materials that I that I pulled together. Um, it does some reasonably sophisticated sense of fusion between uh, ultrasonic and pyroelectric sensors. At least it was sophisticated for the early 1990s. That robot runs a uh, first generation embedded microcontroller using a 68HC11 chip running at the blinding speed of 2 megahertz with 128k of RAM. And it's, an interesting, it's interesting to reflect now to see how much behavior and how much complexity one can generate in uh, a machine like that with extremely limited uh, computational power. It's essentially a machine uh, for bodily interaction. And I should say that one of the most interesting parts of, of watching the machine when it was presented in public was the degree to which users actively engaged the machine and projected motivations and complexities on the machine which the machine does not have. Fundamentally, it has two kinds of behavior. One of them is a, a simple obstacle avoiding behavior in the absence of people. And when uh, people are present, it has a different behavior of attraction and a maintenance of a kind of sensitive interpersonal distance. That is, it, it, it turns to follow you, but uh, it, it moves back if you advance too close. Okay, Olivia, I think we can stop the video, please. This was 95 in Paris, actually. This footage right there. Could you sh stop the video? So, um... Sorry, I would like to now talk about ways of working with digital technologies. One of the, one of the strategies which is, has always been quite common and I think is in more in increasingly common is to look at the array of extraordinary uh, technological widgets and say, wow, look at these wonderful toys, what can I do with them? Now, in my opinion, this approach is bound and limited by the creative imaginations of the tool makers. Inevitably, anything produced will be an instance of the capability of that tool. That is, any Photoshop image is an instance of Photoshop. And in that sense, Photoshop, uh, Photoshop itself is a collaborative artwork, the collaboration of hundreds if not thousands of software engineers. And the choices made by the person on the other side of the user interface, of which buttons to push, is relatively trivial. Perhaps that's a little extreme, but I put the matter in these terms for rhetorical effect. Not only that, but the reduction of artworking to choosing menu items is itself problematic because it assumes that all possibilities are already given as if software were some platonic verity and not the historically contingent cultural production which it is. Such choosing reflects a computationalist reduction of the complexity of living to a series of ser a series, a serial calculation of binary choices. This is a rather insidious aspect of our naturalization to digital technologies. Our, our digital tools are not raw. They are not lumps of clay or stone, blunt or sharp instruments. They are complex cultural products shaped by consumer commodity economics, by markets and marketing, by the profits that can be generated by the mass sale of generalized tools. The internet as a manifestation 
of and a tool for commodity economics has transformed many aspects of life into shopping. Shopping for ideas, shopping for images, shopping for technological widgets, shopping for code snippets, shopping for friends and partners. For me, uh, this, this complex uh, uh, presents a significant pedagogical challenge. It's important to engage students in techno-historical and socio-economic critique of globalized commodities and information networks configured around the idea of consumption and the consumer so that they can make art wisely in this context. There are, so, so these are the implications of a, of a rather unquestioning utilization of technologies like a child in a candy shop. Um, now, an alternative approach is to be conceptually driven, uh, as opposed for, uh, and one might ask, this is my idea, this is my goal, this is the territory I wish to explore, and ask what constellation of technologies is best suited to this task. Posing the problem in this way demands a level of technological capability and a willingness to grapple with big questions, interdisciplinary questions. But in my opinion, it's a good way, if not the only way, to sidestep the constraints of digital commodification. In any case, this is the approach that I have taken. And in what follows, I will try to elucidate that process of simultaneous technological problem solving and aesthetic development and to highlight some critical issues which have emerged. In order to do that, I want to provide a sense of socio-technological context. For although we constantly note how rapidly technologies change, we equally rapidly forget what they were like before. The technology was vestigial, ill-formed or simply broken and it was changing blindingly fast. It was as if the paintbrush in your hand was morphing into a broken airbrush while you painted with it. There was a constant relearning and adaptation. <coughs> Working in that context was, trying, was like trying to stand upright in a rushing river. So to get a sense of that, of the radical change in technology over the past 15 or 20 years, let me take you back, back 20 years. Now, what I show you now, uh, in what I show you now, the dates and details are approximate. This is not the place for a detailed media archaeology. In 1990, MS-DOS was the most prevalent operating system. It had green text on a black screen, there were no graphics and no sound, no laptops, no tablets, no mobile phones, no internet, no Wi-Fi. Data was moved around on floppy disks, 400 and 500K ago. Email was done via a teletype interface, ASCII text only, no attachments, usually using acoustic modems via telephone lines. This is a bit of a vintage acoustic modem, but there you have it. The idea of computer in interactivity was a novelty, as was multimedia and desktop publishing. Digital video was just beginning to happen, and the systems were clunky and weird. This is an Amiga 2000 which hosted the video toaster, and that Amiga 2000 ran at 7.1 megahertz your laptop runs 500 times faster. By 1995, the World Wide Web was just beginning to come online, and getting a sound and video onto the web were hot research topics. 3D animation was new, and virtual reality was a huge thrill. It was only by the end of the 90s that connecting a camera to your computer became really viable. Around the same time, graphics processors on PCs became fast enough to enable re real-time 3D animation. So, particularly in the decade from 1990 to 2000, the rate of technological change was huge, as I assume some people in this 
uh, audience will attest. And this was the context in which artists were trying to make work. It's a very strange context because the, the technological ground was shifting underneath your feet so rapidly. Very curious time. Now, in this context, artists imagined what should be possible, but it was technically often impossible. As a result, many artists, including myself, engaged in technical research and development in parallel with their art practice. This was considered normal, but it created a weird new hybrid identity of artists pretending to be software and hardware engineers, but seldom with appropriate training, resources or funding. People came into the field from the plastic and the performing arts, from film, from media studies, from computer science, itself a young discipline, and elsewhere. And at the outset, nobody knew what to do with computers. Conversations at conferences and dinner parties were often like the blind men and the elephant. In this context, an explosion of creativity occurred, wrapped up in utopian liberatory rhetoric. Do you remember when information wanted to be free? Through the 90s, various aspects of digital cultural practices were taken to be fundamental by different theorists, as you know. For Lev Manovich, it was the database. For Roy Ascot, it was the idea of global, communica global communication, telematics. For some, it was the expansion of narrative and literary practices by embracing interactivity in hypertextual literature or expanding cinema in a second-order expanded cinema. Others, such, uh, uh, others, as divergent as Sherry Turkle and my countryman Stellark, celebrated virtuality, virtual identities, and liberation from the restrictions of physical embodiment. For me, from the late 80s, it was clear that the core novelty of working with computational systems was the possibility of designing behavior. Now, this may have something to do with the fact that my background was in sculpture, installation, and performance. Unlike many who moved into the field from other image media, painting, photography, cinema, video, I was not fixated on the image or the screen. Olivia, could you run the second video, please? Traces. This next piece was developed... Whoops. Lower the volume a little. Thank you. Um, this piece was developed for the cave, a virtual reality environment, and was premiered at Ars Electronica in 1999. What's different about this piece from any other uh, VR application that I know of at the time is that it had a custom 3D machine vision front end. So all of the graphics were generated in real time from the dynamics of the user's body. Now this is a custom infrared markerless volumetric vision system which I built with my colleague Andre Bernhardt through the late 90s, starting about 96. And as you can see on the, on the right there, you have the four control screens. Those are, the, those are the cameras which are actually producing the data, which you can see on the left. Not very clearly, but quite often it's kind of anthropomorphic and it is in fact a kind of digital body model, uh, a volumetric voxel model of the user. That's what we were just watching. Now if you watch the left screen, occasionally you can see a kind of body shape moving through there. That's because the graphics are a three-dimensional cellular automaton, which is working on the voxel model collected from the user in real time. Of course, it's very difficult to shoot video of stereoscopic immersive experience with a single camera. So here's a guy in the cave, waving his arms about and generating these, these voxel volumes. Um, 
not in a particularly clever way. But you'll notice that he's wearing shutter glasses, these who are infrared stereoscopic glasses which present the images on the, on the screens, on the walls and floor as, as three-dimensional to the, to the user. A single user environment, unfortunately. So this is what the cameras see. Three cameras look at the figure. That's my, and this is the voxel models that were generated. And once again, for the nerds amongst you, this was happening on a 166 megahertz IBM PC in real time. This is real time volumetric rendering. So that's the volumetric, the dynamical volumetric body model that generated or, or, or influenced the graphics, shall we say. And there were three different kind of behaviours which users could interact with. This one is, is the 3D cellular automaton. And, uh, in a moment we'll see, there we are, the three different behaviours which were implemented for Ars Electronica in 99. This, this introductory state was like a kind of 3D time-lapse photograph. The body model was captured and then it drifted off into space, becoming increasingly transparent. And of course, as far as I'm concerned, what's important about these kind of works is that in, in experiencing the work, you're simultaneously experiencing a, a, your subjective experience of, of embodied behavior. So um, what's happening at a cognitive level is a, is a kind of disruption of this subject-object relationship that we're used to in interacting with artworks. So that's one of the key ideas uh, that I have about an aesthetics of interactivity is that one of the reasons why it's such a radical thing to consider is that the, 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 this very fundamental subject-object dualism is, uh, is collapsed, both temporally and spatially. This guy gets so excited he drops his shutter glasses. They were expensive too. You watch, he jumps around a bit. Boom, there they go. Good thing that he's the director of Ars Electronica or he would have been in big trouble. <laughs> and this, this behavior, which is strange because you're seeing it in some sort of wonky stereo, was a sort of elementary um, flock of autonomous agents which responded to the, to the body model. Or, or to the volume of the user. So sometimes they would be attracted to the user, sometimes they'd be repelled, sometimes they had their own flocking behaviours. So once again, it was an implementation of some of these ideas from artificial life theory. Reynoldsian flocking is, is underlies this code, but, but with a, a live, immersive, interactive uh, uh, dimension. Okay, Olivia, could you shut off the video? Thank you. Give me back the keynotes. So, moving on to part three. What, what was happening through the 90s in particular in my analysis is a, a, a period of 
explosive and anarchic invention. Um, before, uh, before genres were established, and genres slowly started to be established, of course, and in my opinion, roughly around, around 2005, the digital arts went into a shift, into a, a shift of state, a, a phase change, like a shift from gaseous to liquid, uh, more organised, um, you know, suddenly computer game companies were worth billions of dollars. Uh, corporate media figured out how to colonise the internet. Um, information was certainly no longer free, even if it wanted to be. And the NSA is recording everything we do and say. Um, but it's important to understand that much of the formal interactional and technological capabilities which structure contemporary popular digital culture were developed and incubated within the media arts interdisciplinary research context of the 90s. To take a case close to my heart, there is very little in the machine vision platforms of the We and the Connect that was not prototyped by artists in the 90s, if not in the 80s, or in the 70s. We're going right back to the work of Myron Kruger and his pioneering work, Video Place, and the subsequently the work of many artists, including, of course, David Rokeby in the late 80s. Now, the same process, we can find the same process in the history of social media, in the history of uh, online gaming, and various other aspects of what is now popular digital culture. And I'm sure many of you can give other examples, and it's a very interesting historical exercise. What's particularly interesting about that from a sociological point of view, I think, is the migration of the intellectual property from a context of, of free and anarchic, unfunded, um, black economy of, of art research into corporate, profitable corporate entities. Now, that movement happened in various ways, some of them more ethical than others. But I feel that there's some historical importance in identifying this this historical transition and these the lineages of the dynamics that we now uh, take for granted in in contemporary digital uh, digital cultures, because of course the, the the purported owners of the intellectual property will never admit to it. Mm -hmm. um. Now and and of course the very fact that that happened, the very fact that a wildly experimental, unfunded, punky, uh, uh, informal context was so incredibly generative should be a, an argument to anybody that, that the funding of, of experimental and interdisciplinary research is, is a, a general good. As Einstein famously said, if we knew what we were doing, it would not be called research, would it? So, um, we've spoken now about the socio-economic dimensions of digital culture, and now I want to turn to some, a more philosophical dimension, which concerns the influence that the culture of computing had on our conceptions of ourselves as living beings. Now, in 1976, the, the fathers of artificial intelligence, Alan Newell and Herbert Simon, formalized their physical symbol system hypothesis. And they stated clearly, a physical symbol system has the necessary and sufficient means for general intelligent action. Now, artificial intelligence as a discipline had, had in fact established itself 10 or 15 years earlier, but this, this, this postulate of the physical symbol system hypothesis is what structures the, the cognitivism which, around which artificial intelligence and cognitive science were built. 
According to the physical symbol system hypothesis, any system capable of manipulating symbols by logical rules is capable of computing, where computing is regarded as equivalent to thinking. This idea is the f uh, uh, builds on Turing's original work, obviously, and also on the functionalism of Fodor. But here, an insidious circularity develops. Computers can be intelligent because they can manipulate symbols. That's the position of artificial intelligence. The position of cognitive science is that the brain is a computer because it manipulates symbols. So this is where this is one of the places, one of the places in where the rhetoric of the deep rhetoric of computing instantiates a, a an idea of cognition, an idea of being in the world, um, which I find to be deeply problematic and I think has been the central uh, 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 critical issue underlying the complexities in the development of digital cultures. This is, this is my point for, for today's talk. The cognitivist view of cognition, which grew out of a tradition of mathematical logic, identifies problem solving in the form of reasoning on symbols via algorithms as intelligence. The problem with this formulation is that it makes no reference to the way we behave intelligently in the world as situated beings. And this was the problem that caused the collapse of the cognitivist paradigm in the 1980s. One name for this was the common sense problem. AI systems, artificial intelligence systems, had no common sense. That is, they had no knowledge of the world. And in the artificial intelligence world, the common sense problem was often framed this way. How to attach meaning to symbols. Now, this very framing we now see as part of the problem because it takes the existence of symbols as primary and logically prior, as if the symbol were the body and the meanings were the clothes. The problem is not how to fasten meanings to symbols. It is quite the reverse. What we have, demonstrably, in our interaction with the world is meaning. We can have that meaning in the absence of symbols. The cognitivist problem is how to bind immaterial and imaginary symbols to pre-existing meanings in order for those symbols to have meaning based in relevance to the world. So here we have the fundamental problem of cognitivism and embodiment. And for me, the to make it very clear where I, what I'm driving at tonight, for me, the collision between the tr traditions of cultural practices and the traditions of computing are the collision between a dualistic conception of mind, mind which is separate and different from body, mind which controls body but is not part of it, Right? and uh, a, a holistic embodied conception of intelligent action in the world, which implicitly is central to a lot of cultural practices, if not all of them. So there's a deep, deep philosophical discontinuity underlying this 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 rhetoric of convergence between arts practices and digital practices. Now, the more we know about biology, about ecology and about neuroscience, the more we understand that cognitivism is just a story we've told ourselves about the mind. And it has scant relation to lived experience. 
The idea of mind, thinking and intelligence that is carried and reinforced by computer culture is a story about abstract immaterial symbols and logical systems running on an arbitrary hardware platform. The problem is that explication of art practice in cognitive terms cannot explain, ca is not explanatory because cognitivism is a theory of mind as disembodied and abstract reasoning. It has no resources to speak usefully about lived bodily experience in the world. Now, in my work, I have sought to realize relations with computational systems which attempt to build or address the user as an embodied creature immersed in and in adapting uh, and adapting to the world. So Olivia, could you play Fugitive 2, please? And we'll have a little volume, please. <laughs> A little more. of which there are hundreds of years of traditions, employ sensibilities which are embodied. So for me, the question is, how, how can we envisage and how can we build cultural technologies which uh, exploit or explore some of those modes of interacting with the world? So Fugitive, just to take the case in point, interpret large bodily movement and demonstrates that it, quote, understands large bodily movement of people. The vestibule area More volume, please. seating and two screens. Olivia. One screen provides live video feed from the system. M more volume, please. Seen by the user. The other provides a real-time volumetric rendering of the user in the interaction space derived from the infrared vision system. The user enters the interaction space via a darkened corridor. Light control is critical to the functioning of the system. When the user moves about the space, the image responds instantaneously by changes in its physical position on the wall, generally remaining diametrically opposite the user. But if the user comes too close to the image, it runs away. The action takes place in a 9 meter or 30 foot diameter circular room. Inside the space, mounted overhead, are 12 infrared floodlights, 4 video cameras and a video projector suspended from a motion control rig. Adjacent to the interaction space is a control room containing two PCs running the vision system, the video database system and real-time 3D rendering. The heart of Fugitive 2 is the multi-camera machine vision system. This system constructs a real-time 3D model of the user in the interaction space derived from the four camera images. All behavior of Fugitive is based on information from this system. Acceleration, velocity, angular movement of the user and other parameters are extracted from the vision system data. Specific values for these parameters trigger entry into and exit out of specific locations in specific video clips. The video database contains over an hour of video encoded as motion JPEG. 
There are nine locations and a total of 437 shots. Each location is captured as full circle pans and zoom shots for every sector. There are generally 24 zooms or one for every 15 degrees of rotation. Each zoom shot is indexed to a specific keyframe on the pan so that the transition from pan to zoom and vice versa is coherent. When the user moves around the room in an orbital circular path, they trigger a pan shot. As they continue to move on such a path, sequential frames of the pan are presented across the wall as if a virtual window was moving across the wall. If the user moves radially towards the image, a zoom sequence of the view from that point in the pan is shown. In all cases, the frame rate of the video is proportional to the user's velocity. It's very important to me okay, that... You can stop the video there, please. As a user. So, uh, just to unpack uh, that piece. The piece takes place in a circular room, a large circular room, 10 metres in diameter. Um, and essentially there are two kinds of movement that that the user undertakes in the room. One of them is circumferential or orbital and the other one is radial. And the, the system understands those two kinds of movement. And at any time there is one particular location loaded in the, in the, uh, in the from the database so that any radial movement will trigger a zoom as if the, as if the user is moving t towards the object. And if they walk around the space, then the pan function uh, is set up. <coughs> but each frame is indexed to a specific real angle in the real space. So that you need to walk a full circle in order to see the circle of the panorama. And the, the image is always 180 degrees opposite you except when you run towards the image because of course that would that you know the whole the thing breaks then so if you run towards the image and the image swings around and, and then gets 180 degrees away from you so there's a kind of cat and mouse game and what's interesting about it is that what you're playing with is not this is not the imagery you're playing with the behavior of the system which is which is ex expressed by the pan rate and the frame rate of the zooms in and out and the position of the image on the walls. The content is irrelevant, the, the, the image content. But from another point of view, um, the piece kind of does cinematography in reverse. It re-embodies the cinematic. Because when we sit in a, in a, in a cinema like this uh, watching a fixed screen and, and and the, the filmmaker wants to give us the impression that the world is going that way, right? Nothing moves. We don't move in relation to, to the image. So, so, in a sense, a fugitive puts the, puts the user as the cinematographer in the original space. So, moving on. I didn't want to say that yet. Okay. Um, I want now to talk about the position of art practice uh, with respect to academic traditions. Now, in our academic epistemology, uh, well, our, our, our academic epistemology centers around the idea of extracting knowledge from the world, distilling it, encapsulating it in the form of abstractions, generalizations, and symbolic notations. We call these things postulates, papers, theories, equations, databases, simulations, and sometimes poems. Generally, we refer to them as knowledge. 
in general, the academic world, the, the academic, academic culture takes the world and turns it into symbols. Part of the ontological dilemma of the arts in the contemporary institutional context is that artists don't do that. Artists work in the world. Artists work with sensation, with materiality, with embodied experience. Artists take bits of the world and make more world. Often the process of transformation into symbolic notation is completely absent. Sometimes it happens as a kind of transitional state, like the writing of a musical score. Sometimes it happens in development processes, notations, drawings, sketches. But it's not necessary and it's not a necessary end state. So there's a fundamental sort of ontological rift between academic, the epistemology of academic culture and the ontology of the arts. It would be like Einstein coming here and saying, this is my theory of relativity and now I'm going to perform it. It's my little joke. So, in the cultures of the arts, there's an underlying commitment to embodied being, to the idea that our activities in the world, we are not meat robots for a computer brain. Computer culture proposes that physical instantiation is arbitrary or irrelevant. That's one of the fundamental postulates of functionalism. So, this is the deep theoretical crisis which rolled, and in my opinion still rolls, like a tide or a tsunami underneath the super superficial effects of digital culture, under speed and resolution and capacity, under social media and augmented reality and gaming, under the web and real-time video, under Skype and Twitter and Facebook and whatever comes next. So very happy to have discussion and questions. I hope that Thank you very that helped. Thank you very much, Simon. Si vous avez des questions ou si un conseil, il a pas de problème. I have one question. Yes, sir. So it was a sort of historical uh, story of this uh, relationship between culture, cognitivism, and art, mm -hmm. digital art. So if I, if I understand well, the problem, because there is a problem with, with digital art, is this kind of dualism between this uh, embodied mm. uh, approach yeah. and this uh, uh, computational approach. And what do you think? Do you think that today is the same situation or things have changed? I think the same problem is still present. It's not quite so obvious because the tools have become increasingly sophisticated. The media, the objects, the widgets have become, and we've become increasingly naturalized to them. So the things that that stood out as being obvious in the 90s because we were dealing with really raw technology and raw realities. I think it's, uh, that's why I say it's a, a, a different stage now that we've moved from this kind of r raw experimental period into a, st a stage of the construction of genres and the naturalization of a public to certain kinds of forms. So the, the philosophical and the pedagogical work to be done to, to get back and, and, and discern where those rifts are occurring is different and I think quite difficult. Yeah. But my, my argument is that, I mean the general argument of why we ought to do this is that the dualistic notion of being upon which the computational worldview is based 
is simply wrong. And if we have built our technologies on a wrong theoretical premise, then there's it, that it makes it's very clear that therefore they don't work very well. And if we could conceive of media technologies that were based in a in a in a different sense of being, um, shall we say, a more phenomenological mm. conception of being, then we may in fact be able to produce uh, more effective uh, digital tools. Um, I have a question uh, concerning frontiers. Mm -hmm. I think uh, you started out in a very interesting way um, telling the story, the historical, your, your own historical experiences of, of the punk 90s and the rapid development. And then the end uh, of the lecture made me a little bit more confused. Um, since there you shifted kind of the, the idea of the frontier to to describe it as a frontier between art and academia, whereas in, in the 90s, I would say the, the description you gave was more um, about a frontier between, um, let's say, the commercial, even right. mil military complexes yeah. and the more creative approach to, to technology. Um, and uh, I'm also um, always a little bit uh, annoyed with uh, artistic researchers trying to to uh, construct the enemies, so to say, within the academia. Uh, as we all know, there has been other paradigm shifts also in other fields, like, I mean, also philosophers like N Nelson Goodman, Goodman uh, developing ideas about world making and, and the difficulties of, of sampling without creating and so forth. Um, so. I would I would like to ask you again if you if you really if you if you really identify the frontier really between art and academia and not ah. yeah more in in a more kind of uh -huh. similar way as in the 90s still as a frontier between commercial and possibly military forces and the more creative possibly also right. low uh, tech approach yes, to, yes. To, to the world. Right, thank you, that's a wonderful question. Um, I don't feel that that I shifted, uh, nor do I feel that I'm pointing to uh, uh, theoretical academia as the enemy. I, I think perhaps what I did not uh, make clear is that the commitment to abstract symbolic representation, which underpins the, co the computational worldview, in fact arises from a much older con uh, uh, set of conventions of which academia is part. So if we trace the philosophical lineage of, of cognitivism back through through, through functionalism, etc., back to Descartes and the Enlightenment, um, we find a, a context there where the, uh, which, which evolves in the academy over the next 250 years in, uh, in ways which increasingly begin to privilege abstraction. Um, so that certain kinds of practices which were uh, artisanal become increasingly mathematized. And this happens particularly in the second half of the 19th century. And this has been observed by ver various historians that the, the entire field of engineering m transitioned from a kind of artisanal practice to a mathematized practice where the real physical, the phenomena of the real physical world and the manipulation of matter were only um, uh, methods by which to attain the sort of abstract mathematical verities. So that, so that in academia uh, we see this trend away from embodied practice and into abstraction in the same way that we see it in, 
in, in, in, com in computer culture, and that's, uh, that's it's clear why, because of course the culture of computing comes out of the traditions of engineering and other, and other academic cultures which themselves went through this transition in the, in the second half of the 19th century. No, what I mean is that is is it really creative to um, kind of fall back into that kind of dichotomizing, or should we be more creative and try to find new frontiers that are perhaps more kind of rewarding? Um, I, I just take one example. It's the discussion uh, of the uh, of the um, what's it called now the the free phone. The free phone is a, is a mobile phone uh, that is now under creation, like a, a, a creative common. Um, but the discussion is there that this process is already commodified and controlled by the big companies. And so there must be a new frontier and other ways of, of kind of um, uh, developing a more collaborative and uh, democratic and just uh, living with technology. Well, there's a number of different issues in there. I mean, obviously, th there's a, a vast range of complex issues of, of, of commodity capitalism and, 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 uh, and democracy, uh, etc. You know, there's liberatory rhetorics of technology, utopianism, etc., etc. Um, you know, I, I tend to, I mean, particularly here where, you know, this, this community is completely unknown to me, I think my goal was simply to uh, put my argument in in as clear way as possible that as one could do in a 30-minute paper. Um, there are complexities and subtleties and discussion points um, that I'm sure each of us could sit down, you know, and and have different kinds of conversations. Um, but you know, my concern was to was w was to highlight this. Um, the que question of embodiment uh, uh, and and uh, and cognitivism, you know, uh, uh, because I don't, I don't. Uh, it seems important to emphasise. D'autres questions? When when you speak about your fugitive uh, installation. I think you you say it's not um, the image is not relevant. It's not important. Why you you can say that? Maybe it's important to to make a distinction between the apparatus and the content. Yeah. But I think as an artist, you have to find a solution to to find a fusion between a image and a apparatus. I right. Well, yes and no. Um, I was very clear in building Fugitive that I did not want to create a scopophilic experience. I did not want the user to focus on the nature of the image or to discern or follow qualities of the image like characters or certain kinds of objects. I didn't want any narrative, right? The reason was that what I was concerned with was drawing the, the user's awareness to their own behavior as, be, as integrated into the dynamic of interaction. So I, I, if the image was interesting, then the user would, f would, would reconstruct this subject-object dualism. So my task was to make the image as boring as possible, <laughs> right? So, the <laughs> so, and I perhaps I failed, but I did succeed in in avoiding narrative and characterization and other qualities that people quickly want to assign to the moving image. <laughs> um, you could have used light. <laughs> also, instead of images, <laughs> uh, I'm wondering if, uh, um, at the end, when I was looking again at uh, fugitive addresses, 
What strikes me this time is that you are asking to the, or proposing to the user, to the visitor, uh, to do a kind of gymnastic, yeah. well, I don't know. Um, so do you think that, um, uh, I was wondering if it's not a little, uh, a limited um, approach of behavior. His behavior really so much, <laughs> I'm sorry, it's a difficult question. But, uh, always I'm uh, very much concerned with what you said at the end, artists work with sensation mm. also, or with emotion or empathy as you have done with Petit Mal. Mm. And mm. I have the feeling that with Petit Mal we have a much more, a, a deeper relation to this kind of uh, behavior from, I don't know, machine object, or, which brings us back to our own behavior. But in case of fugitive or traces, I'm not sure. Wha what do you, how do you? Well, I think that there is a similarity, uh, even though it's very clear in Petit Mal, because Petit Mal is a materially instantiated agent, um, which is behaving in response to your behavior. In fact, the dynamics of the interaction in traces or in fugitive is, is almost exactly the same. Well, what I mean is that, that you're engaged in an ongoing um, uh, conversation with the agent via its perception of your bodily actions. And you're disagreeing. Yeah, yes, I disagree. <laughs> <laughs> Am I wrong? <laughs> that important, but uh, no, it I is think important. that um, what we are uh, engaged with in traces of fugitive is something which is much more um, abstract. We are not, uh, mm, uh, we, we are not uh, solicited to produce this kind of empathy that we are doing uh, for uh, Petit Mal, I mean we project mm. for traces, it's much more uh, uh, game. I see my bo the consequence of my movements on uh, abstract mm. world. Mm. Or, uh, so it is not the same for me. I, uh, each time I have experienced uh, mm. the three pieces. Right, right, right. In real. And um, I remember I had a lot of fun with fugitive or running, mm. image, but it was like uh, I was playing with a system and I'm not uh -huh. sure it was taking me back to my own behavior. I was running, uh, maybe running uh, for what? I don't, um, you know, I have the same question as Samuel about uh, the image. <laughs> 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 I actually, I, w I found interesting the image. Even if for you, <laughs> you say it's not the most important, I like the way you were systematically playing for our perception with uh, this zoom and mm. panorama. And I think that's, this was something uh, interesting. Yeah, well I still don't know why we had to run around. <laughs> well, I suppose, you know, I, I can really speak to that. And it's, it's interesting because I've been thinking about that uh, this week and, and I want to actually become more extreme with this idea. Because, um, I would, number one, it amuses me that people emerge from my work sweating, red-faced, and b panting, breathing heavily. I just find that interesting. I find that amusing, uh, perhaps. <laughs> um, and I'm really against the passivity of the contemplative consumption of artworks. You know, I, I, uh, I want to think of a way to engage people in dynamic bodily behavior which has kind of real work attached to it. You know, and this is one of the things I've been thinking about, the sort of intelligent architecture, instrumented spaces, sensor-based interactions um, that we all make, right, is that you, you glide through these spaces and things happen but you're not doing any work, you know. In fact, I mean, it's a kind of green position, I suppose, that, that what's running this? You know, some coal-burning power plant or nuke 
you know, 20 miles away, driving all this machinery so that we can have this amplified virtual experience, which, which fundamentally is a kind of you know, um, going back to that, that, um, to that, that um, mythology of the virtual. You know, back in, again, you know, that, that somehow you can have infinite movement and infinite power uh, and weightlessness. Uh, and I'm just opposed to that whole idea. You know? So I'm trying to think how I can make artworks that, that, that some people can do and some people can't do because they're not strong enough. <laughs> you know, I want... I, I wouldn't mind making artworks that, that actually bruise people, you know, that you... Thank you. <laughs> Go ahead. Hello. I have, I have a question. Um, when you talked about petit mal, mm. you said it was a physically instantiated agent. Yeah. And earlier in your talk, when you talked about uh, the common sense problem, you said the real problem was that it presupposes a prior symbol. Uh, for, for for me, the the, the notion of instantiation, uh, when you instantiate something, especially in computer science, mm. uh, you're instantiating a set of symbols, mm. and that set of symbols actually becomes a behavior, or becomes an agent, or becomes mm. something. Mm. And so there seems to be, to me, like a kind of a contradiction mm. or a, some right. sort of strange thing there that I'd yeah. like to know more about. What I think you're exactly right, and I, you, you, you're sticking your finger right on the sensitive spot of the whole situation. You know, is that is is that we have this idea that by constructing symbolic systems in algorithms, we can produce something that's analogous to to biological agency, and I just think that's fundamentally wrong. I uh, that we as biological beings have meaning by virtue of metabolizing and when we cease to have meaning is when we cease to metabolize and we cease to exist biologically so there are there are two radically different theories of cognition one of them coming out of ethology and biology and physiology, which says to live is to cognize. Of course, Maturana put this most succinctly. You know, he basically identifies living and cognition. Bacteria cognize. You know, if they didn't, they'd be dead. And, and th that's a completely different conception of cognition from the sort of representationalist convention or notion of cognition which is you know instantiated in the vast majority of these technological artifacts computational artifacts I mean it's built right into it right I mean you can't have a Turing machine without representation and that's okay you know we can we can make stuff with with computational representations like we make stuff with bricks and mortar but it's not alive, you know, and it's not cognizing. You could, you can simulate it, you can approximate it. I mean, it, you know, I mean, it, look, it's a, t it's a discussion point for sure. This is the conversation I want to have. You know, because I think getting deep into the philosophical underpinnings of computational processes is something that we have not done. Computer scientists don't want to do it. Philosophers of, philosophers of mind don't have the know-how, right? But we as artists move between, uh, as, as media artists, as people who try to work with this technology to achieve the ends that that cognizing biological, environmentally situated beings want, are moving back and forth between this realm of, of logical artifice and, and this realm of biology. 
And, and I'm, I, I, I feel like we need, you know, we really need to go deeper into that. Because it may be possible to build models of, I mean, it may be that in terms of my argument, fundamentally, we have to throw away computers completely. You know, they're useless. Right? It may be. Or it may be that we can, by thinking, by denaturalizing ourselves to, uh, to, uh, to certain kinds of concepts and to, by thinking around the problem in another direction, come up with paradigms for computational solutions which can be radically new and different. And I, I hold out the possibility that... But, but I think computation presupposes symbols in general. And instantiation is... is, is I'm not so sure. I, this comes down to that fundamental computer science AI conversation about representation. And when you ask an AI specialist what a representation is, they can't answer you. Because one, and Rodney Brooks pointed this out in the late 1980s, that one of the ideas that, that organises artificial intelligence is the idea of representation, of knowledge representation. But every single practitioner has a different notion of what he means or she means by representation. And that this idea of representationalism is ported into neuroscience and cognitive science with the assumption that we represent, that cognition is representation. And what that does is it enforces a kind of von Neumann-esque seriality. We perceive, we process, we output, right? Input, processing, output, the von Neumann machine, the seriality of it. We don't do that. That's wrong. You know, that's the problem with cognitivism, is that it enforces a model of cognition onto us, which is not true. Right? The Cartesian dualism is not true, and the cognitivist notion of representationalism and seriality are not true either. That's the problem. The fundamental precepts that we're working with are wrong. <laughs> In my humble opinion. <laughs> <laughs> the last one. Thank you very much. I um, come from cognitive science. <laughs> oh, uh -oh <laughs> I'm in trouble now. <laughs> and uh, at one moment, ex I, I was very fascinated by artificial intelligence, and then I went to artificial life and you mentioned it several times with auto, um, automata and cellular and uh, Brooks and Rotten. you also mentioned the um, lantern, right? no Reynolds, Reynolds, Reynolds so and Brooks, Brooks, the whole gang and yeah. all these people that make a switch because exactly they said we don't have any um, we don't know if the brain works in parallel. It seems that it doesn't work in parallel. It works massively in... Uh, no, it doesn't work serially. It right. works in parallel. Right. So new paradigm emerge, and many beautiful things have been done in computer science, and especially in robotics. Right. This approach actually arrived because artificial life mm, find limits of their approach for um, simulating or emulating or reproducing perception and learning, but is a still very valuable approach to reproduce reasoning and some kind of problem solving. So I think that science proceed by step, right? right. And then nowadays, artificial life also is facing some big problems and they mm. can't solve it. But at one moment, 20 or 30 years ago now, the, it allows robotics to do great things. Now we mm. have robot that can walk mm. in a totally unknown environment. Mm -hmm. So I think that a concept that you skip, <laughs> in mm. my opinion, during your talk was the concept of environment. Because 
the symbol hypothesis is okay when you have um, kind of uh, static intelligence system, which are computer that are reasoning so we ca can interact with them and they react to our action. The thing that we had in the, I agree with you actually, <laughs> about the installation. This is just an interactive installation. Yeah. But when you have embodied, no, but when you embody two agents that are instantiated in an environment, right. things are very different because you, the system does not only react to your action, but is supposed by our brain to be capable of spontaneous action. And this change Totally, because I attribute to the agents to be able to do something spontaneously. And in this way, I give him the probability to be eventually a living being. Mm. And I won't we never do this with my phone or my computer. I will always suppose that behind there is a system or somebody that is calling me. Not the agent is just a... Um, um, uh, distant, distant, but mm -hmm. and this is a medium, but right. with robots is different. They are not supposed to be m only a medium right. from other agents. We don't know why, but we attribute them agency, mm. and this is something different. And m my ah. opinion, the behavior is strongly related to the environment, <laughs> and uh, in 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 into the. Wow. This is my opinion as a cognitive. Well, I, I think we, I think we generally science. agree. Yeah. You know, I, I d I'm not sure Thank that you. I couldn't find anything in what you were saying which I would disagree with. No, no but thank you. Ah, well. Well, I would. I, I mean, would. Thirty years of. Uh, yes, of course. <laughs> you know, I mean, I, 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 would love to give another talk on artificial life and okay. artificial life art. Um, you know, I chose. You know, you know uh, there are many references, many ragged ends in this talk, uh, which could each be a long conversation. And certainly, the part that I did not develop as fully as the other two parts is is the question of where artificial life stands in this development of, of art practice with, with behaving uh, agent-like systems. Um, I do think it's very important and, and I'm, I you know, spend a lot of time w working with those sorts of ideas and, and considering their importance in, in, in cultural practices. Um, and I do understand the limitations of the sort of reactive paradigms and the various histories, different kinds of evolutionary systems, um, uh, there, there's a lot there, you know, and we can't cover all in one night. Yeah, <laughs> sure. Thank you very Thank you. much. Thank you, Simon. Et en tout cas, on aura le temps peut-être d'approfondir, parce que Simon, il reste ici un mois, donc euh, nous, on va continuer euh, à, à discuter avec lui sur, sur toutes ces questions. Et bah, je vous remercie euh, tout le monde euh, d'être là et je vous annonce dans la prochaine rencontre pour les conférences hybrides, lundi 5 mai, toujours ici à 19h avec euh, Michael Croning. Merci beaucoup à tout le monde. And thank you very much. Le privé. Bon, ça, donc euh, ça c'était euh, plutôt euh, pas mal.